Good morning. This is Pastor Larson with Trinity Lutheran Church and a good group of people who have joined us for our Bible study this morning. The Bible study is entitled Expectations. Expectations. This is the Sunday morning Bible study recorded on Saturday for broadcast at Sunday at, at 10 o'clock. And you can find us on the internet at trinitydelray.org. Expectations. We're going to continue that theme as we consider what God has expected of his people. What does he expect? What does he expect? Well, the Lord had expectations for Samuel, and we're going to see that if we get to it today. You know about his expectations for Eli, but here's a new one, the Lord's expectations for us. And I'll not let that lay heavy on your heart now. That should come a little bit later, all right? Expectations. Let's go and recall what God has done. The big miracle at the beginning of 1 Samuel chapter 1, he gave children to a barren woman. What was her name? Hannah. Hannah. In answer to her prayer and the vow that she made, and what was the vow that she made? Uh, to give her firstborn. Yes. To give Samuel over to the uh, priesthood. That's right. And then she gave Samuel into the care of a priest named Eli. And as we left last week, we were seeing how God judged both Eli and his sons as being unworthy of the priesthood. And I think you learned as a child, because you were all brought up right, you know what I mean by that, that there are consequences to your decisions and to your actions, and even, God says, to your thoughts. There came a man of God to Eli, and when you read in verse 27 of 1 Samuel 2, a man of God means a prophet. If you study that phrase in the Old Testament, you'll see that that comes true every time it is a man of God. This is not an angel, and it's not the same as the angel of the Lord. A man of God, a prophet, came to Eli. He is without a name, without an introduction, and we don't know anything else about him. And what did that man of God say to Eli? And I really do want you to help me out and uh, read when you see R-E-A-D in capital letters, I am having that expectation that if you want to, please, someone read for Samuel 2, verse 30. Okay. Uh, Therefore the Lord, the God of Israel, declares, I promised that your house and the house of your father should go in and out before me forever. But now the Lord declares, far be it from me, for those who honor me, I will honor and those who despise me shall be lightly esteemed. Now, in the Hebrew, when God makes those comparisons and says, lightly esteemed, he really means not esteemed at all. So lightly that there is no esteem. Mm. Uh, there, is, there, is, uh, there is mercy for those who repent, but in this case, there is no repentance. And those who honored God were, were honored and still are. And now there are those who despise him, Eli and his sons, and they won't be esteemed by God at all. Yeah, I think the NIV, NIV Bible refers to it, will be disdained is the word that's used. That's a good translation there. So God says, I promised, but now, do you see the contrast? Now, my question of you is, is the Lord going back on his promises? I thought the Lord keeps all his promises. Let me go back and see what you read. I promised at your house and the house of your father should go in and out before me. That in and out before me is the priesthood. Is he going back on his promises? I don't know word forever is is the key word there forever yes 
Well, is it going to end? Is the Lord going to revoke his promise to Eli's house? Uh, he more or less says so. He, 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 warns, he warns us in the promise uh, that there will be consequences for uh, our actions. That's right. In consequence of those who despise the Lord, the priesthood would be taken away from his family line. And you know the word house. We discussed that last week. The house of your father, the house of Eli, is the family line, his lineage. His sons and his grandsons and his great-grandsons will not be priests. All right? There are more consequences. It gets worse. A condemnation was coming upon the house of Israel. Another reader, please. Behold, the days are coming when I will cut off your strength and the strength of your father's house, so that there will not be an old man in your house. Then in distress you will look with envious eyes on all the prosperity that shall be bestowed on Israel, and there shall not be an old man in your house forever. Wow. Yeah. This phrase, the days are coming, is a very common phrase among the prophets. In fact, over 22 times that phrase is used in the Old Testament. The days are coming. Maybe your parents have said that to you once in a while. You know, the day is coming when you will... <laughs> And they were prophesying about you would discover something about your life that they weren't able to get through to you. And you grew up and you said, you know, they were right. Those days did come. Mama said there would be days like this. There would be days like this, my mama said. <laughs> yes. Now, this is, um, this is a, a promise, a consequence uh, that, that ends it for this family. To say there will not be an old man means that everyone is going to either die young, either by sickness or by sword in battle. When you're a father of a family and you have a lineage and you expect people to be born after you, and then you get that sentence, it's a real end, especially when you consider family to be important. And we do, we do consider family important, don't we? Even more so these days. Yeah, definitely. Even when they're in another state. Mm -hmm. You know, if you like Zoom and you want to talk with your family, you can fire up Zoom and get them on and you can do just what we're doing now. The, the 40 minute version is free. You can have some fun with it. You put everybody on there together in different states and have a, a family reunion. <laughs> Just an idea. Moreover, the Lord uh, pronounces a terrible end to all the expectations Eli once had for his sons. Who else likes to read? I'll read. Um, the only one of you whom I shall not cut off from my altar shall be spared to weep his eyes out to grieve his heart. And all the descendants of your house shall die by the sword of men. And this that shall come upon your two sons, uh, Hophni and Phineas. Phineas, this this line. Phineas mm -hmm. shall be the sign to to you. Both of them shall die on the same day. Ooh. Is the Lord serious about sin? Uh, he holds uh, his he holds his holy servants to a very high standard. I want that to sink in. They, this only one of you whom I shall not cut off from my altar. Um, I have that on a footnote. The one spared is probably a grandchild. It's, the person is not named. But that grandchild would be relatively young at this point in time. And this grandchild, the only survivor that will live a longer life, will weep his eyes out. 
and he will see all the descendants dying, and he will know that the glory of the priesthood that should have been his was lost. My question of you, though, to talk about, is the Lord justified in his judgment? Yes. Well, just the, the Lord is the Lord is always right. Unfortunately, we we uh, can't um, you know um, we can't say elsewise. I think I was just thinking. Sometimes, though, I think we as human beings want to make ourselves the God, and we sometimes judge people that may die young or something of that sort, and we may say it was because they didn't follow are living a good life and that sort of thing. We have to be real careful with that in the, in today's world, um, that we don't play God and, and kind of bring this type of a promise on them or think that, think that that type of a promise was brought on them by God. You don't know, do you? No, we don't know. I think it's an example. It's an example, it's an example that you should take heed to and it's probably where the, the saying comes, the sins of the father passes down. Is that where that comes from? It's visited upon the third and fourth generation. Uh, yes. Those that hate me, but don't stop there. But promising love, steadfast love, and to all those who love me and keep my commandments. Hmm. So you look up that passage in the Old Testament and, uh, and get the rest of it. The prophecy came true. Now, if in order to do this, if we were sitting there at the tables, I would have asked you to flip your Bibles ahead to 1 Samuel 4, which we're probably not going to study here, but I wanted you to see that the prophecy came true. And there are no hard words except Hophni and Phineas here, so take a deep breath and someone read the... Okay. So the Philistines fought and Israel was defeated and they fled every man to his home. And there was a very great slaughter for 30,000 foot soldiers of Israel fell. And the ark of God was captured. The sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, Phinehas died. A man of Benjamin ran from the battle line and came to Shiloh the same day with his clothes torn and with dirt on his head. When he arrived, Eli was sitting on his feet by the road watching, for his heart trembled for the ark of God. And when the man came into the city and told the news, all the city cried out. When Eli heard the sound of the outcry, he said, what is this uproar? Then the man hurried and came and told Eli. Now Eli was 98 years old and his eyes were set so that he could not see. 30,000 died. The ark of God was captured. That is huge. That should be in 96-point uh, type. If it were on the, on the headlines in a newspaper. Ark captured. So Eli's reaction, his heart trembled for the ark of God. If we had time, we would go and we'd study all the history of, of the ark, that golden box with the tablets of stone containing the Ten Commandments and the, pre the bread of the presence. The, the promise of God is this, this will, this will mark my presence in the, in the tabernacle and in the temple. So he wanted to know what was going on. He's 98 years old and he can't see. There's more. And the man said to Eli, I am he who has come from the battle. Right from the Sorry battle. about that. Go ahead and read it. Oh, my son. Who is and going to read man, aloud? And the man said to Eli, I am he who has come from the battle. I fled from the battle today. And he said, how did it go, my son? He who brought the news answered and said, Israel is dead before the Philistines, and there has also been a great defeat among the people. Two sons of Hophni and Phinehas are dead. 
the ark of God has been As soon as he mentioned the ark of God, Eli fell over backwards from his seat by the side of the gate, and his neck was broken, and he died. For the man was old and heavy. He had judged Israel 40 years. Wow. What a, what a sad ending. Mm -hmm. And they all brought it on themselves. I don't know. You know, once in a while, I... Uh, I lose control of the of the screen. Here we go. God's expectations are the content of his will, his law. And we're talking in general. For people in general, God lays down his expectations for us in his word. And his law says, this is what you shall do. This is what you shall not do. And this is how you shall be. You shall be holy, for I, the Lord, your God, am holy. So God expects us, and this is the good news, to save us through the gospel of his son. And that's his promise. He's not going back on that promise. My question of you is this. Dare we ever set aside any of God's laws? No. no. What did Jesus say? Or whoever relaxes on one of the least. Go ahead and read it, Carol, louder. Will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. Yeah. And this is like the Hebraism that we studied a few minutes ago. By least, he means not at all. If you relax one of God's commandments and say, we don't have to follow that one anymore. I live against you. Um, you're on the wrong side of God. God admit. Admit kind. Uh, so, what's out? So we can't set God. aside any of God's I laws, can we, Corolla? So happy. So happy. I thought she was answering my question. I think she might be on a phone call. No, Walter. Can we set aside any of God's laws? No. 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 Yeah, we can't pick and choose, unfortunately. No. Pastor Larson, you can mute her for the time being. You you have the capacity to mute a person. Yeah. It is so lovely to be able to do this. All right. Thank you. God declares that his expectations for Eli and Eli's sons have not been fulfilled. Nevertheless, I love the neverthelesses in scripture. <laughs> it's not always that particular word, but that's what's going on here. God will not let the failures of these people destroy the lineage that he wants for the holy priesthood. God is setting up a pattern here, and there will be other priests, and they will fulfill his will for Israel. Uh, they will be making sacrifices. During the glory days of uh, David and Solomon, um, there was nothing greater than, than this kingdom of Israel. And during those times, his priesthood was very active. And the, act, and the activities of the priests were being carried on according to that which was laid down in the first five books of the Bible. So God is not going to just say, well, forget the priesthood. He has a goal in mind. God acts to preserve that which is valuable to him. Underline that. God acts to preserve that which is valuable to him and which fulfills his holy will. It doesn't seem like that at times. And I think I know what some of you are thinking he will raise up another line and restart the priesthood. I'm talking immediate future. God says, I will raise up for myself a faithful priest who shall do according to what is in my heart and my mind, and I will build him a sure house, and he shall go in and out 
before my anointed forever. He doesn't name that priest, but it's going to happen. And the new priest and the lineage that follows the new priest will do what is in God's heart and God's mind. In other words, the new priest will fulfill God's expectations. And I will build him a sure house. That is, his lineage will continue. And the descendants of Aaron, down the other side of the line, I'm not doing the family tree for you, it's complicated, but his lineage will be something that will last. And he will go in and out before my anointed. Now the in and out is part of the, the phrase that means practicing the priesthood. And it will be before his anointed. Now I struggled with an, interpreting my anointed. One way to take that word anointed is the kings. But we don't have kings yet. They're coming soon. Saul and David, Solomon, and so forth. But there's another way to take God's anointed. And that is God's people. And I rather think it's the general sense is that the priest of God is going in and out and serving God's people by administering the sacrifices that they are bringing to the altar. The word forever yeah, where's my pointer? The word forever has to do with until I, I get something better. <laughs> you know what's coming. Yeah. So in the foreground, there's going to be a priest in the time of David named Zadok or Zadok. And um, he will be serving as priest. And in the far distant future, uh, I'll give you two guesses. The first one doesn't count. Christ. Yeah, bingo. So Christ is the high priest that is celebrated in the book of Hebrews as the one who fulfills this prophecy. God has built Jesus Christ a sure house, and his lineage is forever. There is no priest after him. And the anointed in that are that Jesus is serving, going in and out before the Father, uh, praying for us, uh, uh, reminding the Father that his sacrifice uh, was sufficient for all of our sins. And that is going to go on. Okay. Any discussion here? Comments. I should give you more time. When the expectations of God are not fulfilled, God says, I will raise up for myself a faithful priest. And I want you to pay attention here to the character of God. You know what I mean by the character of God? His attributes. If you were to describe God, one of the characteristics of our God is that he acts. I will act, he says. Secondly, I will raise up for myself. He's doing it because it is how he carries out his will for the people. He loves them. He doesn't want them to go astray. He wants the sacrifices to continue. That's a big mystery. It's hard to study. And then someone will fulfill my expectations completely and exactly. And you already uh, have the answer to that. And that has only been fulfilled, only will be fulfilled in Jesus Christ. He is the one. And everything in the Old Testament is pointing to him. Sometimes very pointedly, like a sharp arrow. And other times in a general vague sense. Christ is coming. Christ is coming. Messiah will be coming, and he will save us. The people of Israel knew that, the believers. Now, I'm going to pause for a minute, and let's do some application. What are the Lord's expectations of me? Wow. Yeah. 
how, how you find the answer to that is to look into the mirror of God's word. It's in James chapter 1 that we're told to look in the perfect mirror of the law. Well, he wants us to uh, obey the Ten Commandments he gave us. That's a starter. That's a, that's a big one right there. Some of the expectations the Lord has for you. You fill in these blanks. Um, speak aloud. Just name them off. To be faithful to him. To be faithful. More? He, wants, he wants us to share uh, share what we know about him and, and bring others to Christ. What does he want for us? What are the characteristics he desires in his people? To love one another. That's how Jesus summed up the whole law, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. What are his expectations of you? Have you thought about it lately? Shape up or ship out. <laughs> <laughs> well, he never wants you to ship out. He doesn't want you to be like the sons of Eli. Yes, right. Now, I know you're saying, oh, I'm not that bad. Yeah. Of what sins do people need to repent? Pride. Pride. That hits me. <laughs> Selfishness. Mm -hmm. Selfishness. Judgment. Oh, I'm so full of judgment. Don't oh. get me started on that. <laughs> I judge others. I judge too much. Don't don't say anything, Janie. I'm trying not to. <laughs> She's trying not to judge. <laughs> Forgiveness. Forgive one another as God in Christ has forgiven you. Ephesians 4.32. Are you running out of ideas? Well, read the New Testament. You will find in the second half of the letters of Paul lots of exhortations of expectations the Lord has for you. But I'm going to go on, okay? What I want you to do after having up looked at the expectations, and there are dozens and dozens and dozens and hundreds and hundreds of expectations God has for you. And you can't do them all on the same day. <laughs> Sometimes you're doing well enough to do two of them pretty well. Or am I... Am I talking to the same people, I mean, <laughs> real. But when you get done with that, I want you to apply law and gospel to yourself. There are the Ten Commandments in Hebrew. I'm sure you can all read that. <laughs> well, no. maybe not. It's, it's not, it's very small. <laughs> but then, but then we have the gospel of Jesus. There are many crosses. There are billions of crosses in the world. There's only one cross that saves, and that's the cross of Jesus. And this is only a, a picturesque representation of a cross on a hill. I tried to get the music, but um, not today. You know the hymn, don't you? Mm -hmm. You love it on a hill far away stood an old, an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. And I love that old cross where the dearest and best for a world of lost sinners was slain. Uh, the physician came for those who were sick and those are we. the gospel of Jesus Christ. Apply that to yourself every day. Every day. Comments? 
Questions? Objections? When you get up in the morning and you make time to read and pray, and when you talk to God, um, you might as well be honest with him. Yeah. Because you can't fool him. You can't pretend you don't know. But I want you to thank him for sending Jesus and applying the gospel forgiveness of Jesus to yourself and then to others. Okay? Will you do that? Now, let's start a new chapter, all right? I didn't know whether we would get here. We have time to do the beginnings of 1 Samuel chapter 3. And the title, uh, I've given it the title, is Samuel Becomes a Prophet. Here's what's going to happen. God will call Samuel to be his prophet and give him his first prophecy. And in that prophecy, God will pronounce judgment upon Eli's house. I thought we were done with that. No, we have more to come. Samuel will tell this prophecy to Eli. That's his first job. <laughs> oh, what an assignment. We're going <laughs> to test you, Samuel. It will be a test. And Samuel will be established thereby as a prophet of God. A prophet is someone who tells God's word. <clears throat> a prophet does not necessarily tell something that hasn't been recorded in the Bible before. And so this prophet named Samuel has something that is revealed to him, and we're going to see how it happens. And then he forth tells it. So you, you heard that in Sunday school a long time ago, that a prophet foretells or forth tells. He may tell the future because God has told him what the future is, or he may be simply reciting God's word. Now the boy Samuel was ministering to the Lord in the presence of Eli, and the word of the Lord was rare in those days. The word rare means precious, as in few in number. And there hadn't been any word of prophet, uh, there hadn't been a word of prophecy except that one we had in the second chapter, the unnamed man of God. That was a prophet, wasn't it? But the word of God was rare in those days. There was no frequent vision. God was not revealing himself to anyone, through anyone. But now God is doing a new thing. He is calling a prophet. And the word call, I, I mean more than come over here, Samuel. I mean call as in to call into a holy ministry that God is outlining. I don't, I, you know, you look at, this young man named Samuel, and we don't know how old he was, 20s, 30s, not much older than that, but God is doing a new thing, and the Lord speaks to Samuel. Would someone read uh, verses 2 and 3 of the third chapter? At that time, Eli, whose eyesight had begun to grow dim so that he could not see, was lying down in his own place. The lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord, where the ark of God was. The lamp of God is the seven candles of the menorah, and that was lit every night. The candle had not yet gone out. Samuel is in the temple. Where in the temple uh, the scholars have debated, um, the person who painted this picture for us 
has that curtain there. It's not a shower curtain, people. That is the curtain that divides the, the, the temple. It's now a tabernacle uh, from the Holy of Holies. Uh, I think that's the representation that is intended there. And I'm not so sure that Samuel the boy is sleeping that close to the Holy of Holies. It's just a picture. In the Bible, we don't have pictures. We have words that paint pictures, but they're not that clear. But Samuel is sleeping in the temple of the Lord, and so is Eli. All right, you got the picture? The lamp of God had not yet gone out. It could be the early hours of the morning. Everyone is sleeping. And you have this picture. I don't know what kind of beds they had in those days. You know, any, any artist that purports to draw a picture of what it was like has to use an imagination. He even has a throw rug. <laughs> now the Lord speaks to Samuel. Another reader, please. Then the Lord called Samuel and said, Here I am, and ran to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call. Lie down again. So he went and laid down. Okay. You know the story pretty well. Next verse. And, and the, the Lord... Lord... I'm sorry. Go okay. ahead, Jamie. And the Lord called again, Samuel, and Samuel arose and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call my son, lie down again. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, and the word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. To know the Lord is used in different ways in the Bible. Hmm. To know that there is a God is the very least of them, to know him personally by knowing him and believing in him. And then that goes on to experiential knowledge of the Lord. Samuel had not yet heard the Lord speak. So at least it means that. When he heard the voice, he thought it was Eli. Secondly, the word of the Lord had not been revealed to him. We're talking about sp specific word of God that go is going to be revealed to him. What he knows of the temple and the sacrifices has been taught to him by Eli because he has been serving in the temple, not as a priest. Remember, he's not eligible. He's not of the lineage of, of Aaron. Now, uh, the Lutheran Study Bible calls him a priest in the comments. And I went and I looked and I said, you know, he performs priestly duties occasionally later on when he anoints uh, Saul and when he anoints David. That's a priestly duty. But he's never the priest. You got this picture, though, that he didn't know. And he hears the Lord calling, only he thinks it's Eli. Now the Lord is going to speak to Samuel in a specific way. Another reader, please. And the Lord called Samuel again the third time. And he arose and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. Then Eli perceived that the Lord was calling the boy. Therefore, Eli said to Samuel, Go, lie down, and if he calls you, you shall say, Speak, Lord, for your servant hears. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. I bet he can't sleep right now. <laughs> <laughs> there's, a, there's an expectation on the part of Samuel as he goes and he says, Whoa. Yeah. Oh, the Lord is calling me. 
what's happening here? This is, this is a new thing. Not in my expectation. No one ever told me that. So why is it important that Eli know that the Lord is calling the boy? You, did you look ahead? Did you read chapter three? We'll pick that up later. Do you have a guess? Well, I was going to say Eli was pretty old, and so he would therefore know that there would be, I guess, an heir to follow him. Well, it's not really an heir uh, either. An heir, but but uh, someone to carry on the priestly priesthood. But he's not going to be a priest. I've been uh, uh, saying yeah, that's to you. true. Okay. So he's going to. I'll, I'll just tell you that Samuel is going to be a judge and a prophet. He has, to, he has enough to carry as a leader of Israel, and he will lead Israel victorious over some of the enemies as you go on in 1 Samuel. But it's important that Eli knows this, because when the message comes, Eli has got to take it seriously. Not, oh, you just had a dream. Go back to sleep. You understand? The Lord, uh, Eli perceives. How? I don't know. And the Lord came and stood. Now, some people call this a theophany. If I had a whiteboard, I'd write that word on there. Theo, T-H-E-O, Fanny, P-H-A-N-Y, theophany. The appearance of God it happens in the Bible. Uh, one theophany that everybody knows about is the burning bush of Moses. And Moses thought he would die because I have looked upon God. And, and same thing happens um, in the temple when Isaiah is there and, and, the, and he sees uh, the Lord. Woe is me. The Lord came and stood calling as at other times, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, speak for your servant hears. We're going to be winding up with this, this theme today. Speak for your servant hears. Speak for your servant hears. Blank screen, intended. What hymn comes to mind? <laughs> oh, speak, oh Lord. What? Uh, I'm sitting here. Here is that there's a song, there's a song called Hear, O Lord. That's not a hymn, though. Speak for your servant hears. Isn't that part of our liturgy? Nunc to minus? No. Lord, now let us thou thy servant depart in peace. Yeah. That's for mine eyes have seen thy salvation. That's Simeon when he holds the Christ child. Any other guesses? What hymn? You know that I play around with hymns all the time. <laughs> yeah. the music comes up in my head. And sometimes it plays all day. Sorry, Janie. <laughs> <laughs> here it is um, I, have, I was trying to get the music to play and uh, I'll figure that out um, eventually how to get that to play with PowerPoint I've done it before speak O Lord thy servant heareth let your word to me come near I, I know the old version newborn life and spirit give me let each promise still my fear Death's dread power, its inward strife, wars against your word of life. Fill me, Lord, with love's strong fervor that I cling to you forever. This hymn was based on what we hear. Speak, O Lord, thy servant, hear. In the King James, it's heareth. Speak, O Lord, thy servant, heareth. Well, and then they modernized the words for the 2006 hymnal. Well, that's enough of that hymn, I suppose. And the Lord is going to speak to Samuel. Behold, I'm about to do a thing in Israel at which the two ears of everyone who hears it will, will tingle. I'm looking for a stopping place and I'm not finding it. We're about, your hour is about up. The Lord said, I'm going to do something. Pastor, I, oh, go ahead. 
go on. I want to speak. I was just going to play this. Thank you. So what I want to do is uh, go back to that one. You played the music. There it is. Yeah. I'll speak, oh Lord, your servant listens. Yeah. Well, no, we won't have to sing today. Good. <laughs> so I'm going to uh, call this to a close. And what you uh, can do in the coming week is uh, get yourself around your Bible and get into chapter three for what God says to Samuel. And this tingle, <laughs> it's not something good. All right, let's close with a word of prayer, people. Thank you for joining us. Um, this is, we never know where this is going to go and how far we're going to get, but I hope that's okay with you. I hope you're okay with that. Let us pray. O oh God in heaven, attend us this day and keep us from sin. And if we run close to danger, grant that we will all know that you are near to be our helper. And at the end of the day, let us praise you for your goodness in feeding us and clothing us and giving us all that we need, including faith in Jesus Christ, your son, through whom we have salvation and life forever, forgiveness for sins, and a great relationship to you, O Lord. Through his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Pastor Larson with Trinity Lutheran Church. See you next week. Thank you.